Okay, so so we've we've talked about uh, the the problem of evil, and in if I more specifically, I would say it's in one sense the Christians' problem of evil. How do Christians deal with this, and what is their answer to this, and how do they make peace in some sense with the existence of suffering? Uh, what I want to do to end this. Uh, our sessions is I want to talk about two things the, the the nature of morality I think that'll give us that'll help us to see uh, this and this obviously gets into uh, philosophical ethics we'll talk about the nature of morality and how might a naturalist or an atheist ground or support this notion of value or morality in particular, as uh, ethical value, without there being some sort of divine lawgiver that the, the Christians or theists will rely on. So I want to, and, and, and then I want to close by showing, again, I'm going to, you know, I'm harping on this, and I, I'm, I'm jumping up and down on this, but that everything is personal and that morality is going to be ultimately personal and grounded in the person of God and not just as some impersonal law giver. All right? So let's, uh, in, in fact, what I'm going to be saying, in, in, I'm going to be expounding or explicating or describing uh, what I call moral subjectivism. I think that morality is subjective in that you need a valuing subject in order to have any sort of value. Now, hopefully, your alarms are going off a little bit when you say subjectivism. That tends to be to call to mind to anarchy and relativism. You know, it's like whatever. You know, what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me, and that's that's okay. It's not going to be that, but it is going to be more relative than I think Christians are used. to to thinking about morality. So part of this is going to be a corrective. All right, so let's, let's, the, this notion of value, there's, if, if you're looking at reality, there, there are different ways that you can cut, slice and dice it and cut it at its joints, so to speak. But one way to do that is to talk, divide things up in terms of fact and value. So you have, in, in, in one way to get a handle on this distinction between fact and value is to, we can do, hardly do better than going back to David Hume. So David Hume would say, for example, consider any act, any action that some human performs, let's say uh, a willful killing, a, some, some one person has killed another person on purpose. Now, what you can do, Hume pointed out, is you can describe all the physical facts, all the facts of the matter. So, I mean, we won't get into the grotesque details, but, you know, there's a, there, you could get down to the molecules. You know, there are a certain shape of quarks doing this, and you can describe, you know, with, and then it somehow shaped a, you know, these quarks end up, uh, forming a knife and piercing these other quarks and the organism stops living. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can describe it down to its ultra, I mean, specific detail. So a list of facts that you could recreate the entire scene. But in the list of all of the facts about that event, Nowhere will you find a statement, murder is wrong, or that action was wrong. That's a value judgment. So you have this list of facts, all the facts there are about this event. In addition to that, you have a judgment about whether or not those facts are good or bad. That's the fact-value 
distinction. And Hume pointed out, and I think he's right, that you cannot, those are two fundamentally different realms. Fact versus value. And the val this notion of value is kind of mysterious. I mean, the, the facts are mysterious too, but the, this notion of, well, how do you generate value out of just facts? Well, you cannot. Hume says that you can't derive, he, says, he puts it this way, you can't derive an ought, like you ought not do something or you ought to do something. You can't derive an ought from an is. You know, things are just this way. This is the fact. You can't get an ought from an is. And I think that's true. And I think that's very, very important to remember this distinction and to not budge on it. Okay, so here I'm going to, we'll use Dostoevsky again. Dostoevsky had this worry in the, in, in, in the same book, in fact, uh, Brothers K, <coughs> Brothers Karamazov. Uh, so Ivan's, uh, Ivan's view is this, if God is dead, and the grave is our final destination, nothing would be immoral any longer. Everything would be permitted, even cannibalism. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a manifestation of this general worry that if there is no God, then everything is permissible. Anything goes. Now, this is, this is something that atheists want, many atheists, want to fight. They do not, that's bad publicity for atheism, if everything is permissible. So there's going to be some real resistance to that. And I think the resistance is in vain, as I'll, I'll point out in virtue of the nature of value to begin with. So what I'm going to argue here, very briefly, well, you won't think it's brief, but it is brief in philosophical terms, if atheism is true, then there is no objective morality. Or to put it differently, if naturalism, and there are different ways you can put this, if naturalism is true, then so is moral nihilism. Let me put it, remember the conditional. You have the um, if-then statement, the conditional. Uh, you have that sideways horseshoe that's really just for laziness. And you have if... If naturalism, if naturalism is true, notice how we're just, we're, we're, we're um, abbreviating everything. If naturalism is true, then so is moral nihilism or nihilism, either one, tomato, tomato, and they're actually both officially correct, at least in the States. Now, what do I mean by nihilism, a nothingism? Remember, ex nihilo, creation ex nihilo, out of nothing? Well, this is a nothingness. <laughs> You'll instantly think of Heidegger, and I'm avoiding Heidegger like the plague. Nihilism means it's, there is no value. There, how about this? There's no human independent value. Now, certainly there's human dependent value. We value all manner of things. But moral nihilism says that there's no human independent moral value. 
Okay, so that's, that's what we'll be arguing, or I will be arguing. If atheism is true, then there are no human independent moral values. Here's what I'm not saying. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that atheists cannot behave morally. I've seen it done. That, that, that's not the argument. The argument isn't, well, if you're an atheist, you have to behave in a certain way. You know, you're, no. Or if you're, you're an atheist, you, you, you're, you're going to behave more. That's not it at all. Atheists can behave, sometimes better than theists. So that's not, the, that's not what I'm arguing. The other thing that I'm not arguing is that atheists don't want to behave morally. I'm not saying they can behave, and oftentimes they want, it's because they want to. They love their children because they love their, they're, they're, they're good to their children because they love them. They value their children. So it's not as if they don't like moral behavior, and it's not that they can't morally behave. The question is whether or not there's an, it, that the, the values that they have, the behavior that they follow based on those values, is anything more than just their own independent personal values, tastes. I eat ice cream, you know, I have a certain behavior, ice, I, I love ice cream. And so I value it. Therefore, that valuing of ice cream leads me to eat it. But there's nothing objective. That's just a personal preference of mine. I'm arguing that if naturalism is true, morality for atheists are personal preference on a par with any other sort of preferences including tastes in cuisine. That doesn't mean they don't have tastes. That doesn't mean they don't even have good taste. They may have good taste, but it's just taste. Okay. No, no, there's a number of ramifications. You can see why, well, you, you know this already, why an atheist, if they want to spread the news of atheism, they wouldn't want this to get out. They wouldn't want this, you, wouldn't, you would deny this. Because what you would have is something, let's say you have an eagle that eats a fish, you know, kills a fish. That's not, the, the eagle didn't murder, that wasn't a wrong act. The eagle just happened to kill the fish. That's just what eagles do. Similarly, for humans, all the way up the animal scale, someone murders, some, someone kills someone else because they're in their way. It's not a murder, it's a killing. Just like the eagle killed the fish. Now, now that's, going, that's not going to sit well with people because there's something inside of us that knows there really is a rightness and a wrongness to actions that humans perform. It's probably one of the most, the, the, our strongest intuitions is that there are right actions and wrong, that there's good and that there's evil. In fact, if you tried to argue, let's say I tried to argue to you that what Hitler did was a good thing. No matter how good my argument was, it would be using premises that are weaker than your belief that what Hitler did was wrong. I'm going to read another, another quotation. This is, this is one from a serial killer uh, in, in, uh, from the States. Uh, Ted Bundy. Uh, 
he understands this perfectly, at least this. This might have been, I've, I've, I, I've read or heard that he converted. I think James Dobson had an interview with him of, later and all of that. But anyways, in this quotation, he fully gets this. And he speaks as if he gets it. Here's what he says. Then I learned that all moral judgments are value judgments, that all value judgments are subjective, and that none can be proved to be either right or wrong. There is no reason to obey the law for anyone, like myself, who has the boldness and daring, the strength of character to throw off its shackles. I discovered that to become truly free, truly unfettered, I had to become truly uninhibited. Why is it more wrong to kill a human animal than any other animal, a pig or a sheep or a steer? Why should I be willing to sacrifice my pleasure more for the one than for the other? Surely you would not, in this age of scientific enlightenment, aside. Notice how this, this notion of science is part of the reason for thinking that there's no God and that everything is permitted. So what we said previously was not, was not unrelated. So surely you would not in this age of scientific enlightenment declare that God or nature has marked some pleasures as moral or good and others as immoral or bad. In any case, let me assure you, my dear young lady, that there is absolutely no comparison between the pleasure I might take in eating ham and the pleasure I anticipate raping and murdering you. That is the honest conclusion to which my education has led me. After the most conscientious examination of my spontaneous and uninhibited self. This seems like a philosophical proposition. This is just theory. I mean, come on, we're just talking. It, look, I even put it in terms of, a, I even use this dry, conditional, symbolic logic for this. This is just theory. We're just playing intellectual games. Well, you can see that that's not true at all. Con ideas have consequences. And Ted Bundy understood this, and so have many, many, many people. So basically what I'm arguing is if there is no God, then Ted Bundy is right. Now that's going to be met and has been met with resistance from atheists. That's going to... That, now, what on earth could they possibly say to resist that? So let's, let's run through one common answer, one common response. Uh, Sam Harris is a, a perfect example of this sort of view. Uh, in fact, uh, Sam Harris's book, Moral Landscape, I believe, uh, was Richard Dawkins praised it to the nines. It said that this, this converted him from, from moral nihilism to believing that you can have an objective morality without God. So Dawkins says this in Harris, it's Harris's book. Now, the theory is this. It's just good old-fashioned utilitarianism. And utilitarianism is a type of consequentialism, which I'll explain as well. An act is right, or let, let me start with the wrong, I'll start with the wrong. An act is wrong if it produces unnecessary harm. In sentient creatures, so the, this notion of harm, this notion of well-being and suffering, you, it only applies, according to this theory, to sentient creatures, creatures that can suffer, and creatures that can have some sort of well-being. And so an act is wrong 
when it produces this unnecessary suffering in a sentient creature. Now here's what Sam Harris says. He says, look, suffering is what? Well, it's basically just physiological. You know, he's a naturalist and he, he's a pro most, I don't know if he's a materialist, but he certainly thinks that we're largely material. And therefore any sort of suffering is going to really be cashed out in terms of nerve endings somehow. Not just in, and not just necessarily th this notion of touch, but this neurological configuration that you can measure suffering, you can measure pain, you can measure pleasure in terms of, at least theoretically, in terms of cog neurological structures. Now he, he says that neuroscience may it's starting to do this already, but neuroscience may be able to measure pleasure and pain, well-being and suffering eventually. Now, cognitive science is in its infancy, so he doesn't think that we can do that now. And that's okay, even when we can allow him that. But he does say that ethics or morality is going to be based on your physiology. Notice what this does. Neurons, in whatever, the co whatever your physiology is like, is objective. There really is an objective thing, at least, you know, you re there really is something to harm. There's an objective fact of the matter. Regardless of what you think, if you lose your arm, you've lost your arm. There's no, well, you know what, I, I just don't really feel like I've lost my arm. I, I, you know, that, it doesn't really matter. It's not mind dependent. It's objective. It's human independent whether or not a sentient creature is suffering or not. So if ethics, if morality is really just a matter of cognitive neurons or whatever the human configuration is, and that's objective, then morality is objective. It's human independent. It's I mean, certainly it depends on the suffering human, but it, it's independent of what we believe. So you can have objective, human independent morality if Harris is right. That's a big win for, for atheists everywhere. Okay, so this is going to be, this would be pretty exciting. And, and, and Dawkins is excited about this. Okay, now here's the thing. Imagine that we did a scientific study and, ev and we could measure this suffering. You know, let's imagine a perfect cognitive science and we can measure suffering down to the, you know, we measure pleasure, all of that. And we found that every action that we think is wrong ends up causing suffering. So really what you have is you have this connection between wrongness and suffering. That would be good news for the utilitarian, for Sam Harris. You know, at the end of the day, at our final scientific theory, we found every single time there's suffering caused by an action, a human action, it was wrong. And every time we saw a wrong behavior, it caused suffering. So wrongness and suffering track together. Wrongness, suffering, they track, they never come apart. That would be really good evidence for Sam Harris's view and an argument against this. Now suppose that it do, suppose we have that perfect sign and it really does every time you have a, a moral, morally wrong action you have suffering. They never, 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 never come apart. Does that really mean that the suffering is what causes the wrongness? 
does that really mean that it's neurological is what causes the moral? Because that's what Harris is saying. The physiological is causing, is grounding, is determining what's moral. So this is the, the direction. This causes this. If you can measure this, this is objective, then this is going to be objective because this depends on that. Well, just because these track doesn't mean that this causes this. It could be, imagine, think of it this way. What if I said, what if I told you? I come running in here and I go, oh my gosh, guys, you have no, you, you'll have no idea what I just discovered. I've been following this for months. I've got so much data behind this. I, I, I don't know. I don't even know how to. I, I, I just don't know how to. This is so exciting. Um, every time. I've noticed that every time my thermometer goes up, the temperature outside goes up. If it goes up a lot, the temperature upside, outside goes up a lot. And, and, and vice versa. It, it, when it goes down, the temperature goes down outside. I'm going to be rich. I've got a, a little device in my house that, cause, that changes weather. <laughs> it can change the temperature outside. Well, that's kind of what Harris is doing. It may be that wrong behavior does always cause some sort of suffering, but it's not necessarily the suffering that causes the wrongness. So even if they tracked perfectly, just like temperature, you know, my thermometer reading and the, the temperature outside, you know, the feeling of heat or coldness, if those tracked perfectly, that still doesn't mean that the thermometer is causing the, temp the weather change. So it's a bad argument. Now it may be, I mean, now I, I haven't argued necessarily that it's not this, I'm just saying that Harris hasn't provided any argument to think that it is, or at least hasn't given us a conclusive argument that it is. So notice what we're looking for here. We're looking for the, the, the question that we're trying to answer and we're, is, what, when we're looking at this, what makes an action right or wrong? What causes it to be right or wrong? Harris says, well, it's suffering that causes it to be wrong, in, in, for instance. Pleasure would, cause the, would be causing us to, you know, that's what makes it right. So let me give you another argument. So that, that shows that, okay, his argument's not that, not that conclusive. Let me give you an, a more conclusive argument, I think. If I'm right, then it shows that this is wrong. And we'll look at the nature of value itself. So let's see, what, what's the nature of value, what's it like? How do you describe it? What, what, is, what is, this is kind of an ontological or metaphysical, you know, we're getting into, again, this is philosophy, but it's, it's not, it has r radical implications and in, in practical. Let me give you an example. Imagine, uh, I've used this before, but imagine that you're on a deserted island, you know, your plane has crashed, you're the only survivor, you're on this, deserted island and you're trying to survive. You've been there for, for a while and you're really starting to lose it. I mean, your health is going down, you're, 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 get, you're becoming, you're just in despair, you're depressed and the nature is trying to kill you. 
So you're running from some danger, some animal. And you're able to avoid it and you go into a cave. You're starving, you're thirsty, you need clothing, you're, 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 you're about to die. But you find a treasure chest. And it's filled with gold bullion. Oh my goodness. You're going to be disappointed. This is one of the very few cases where that situation would disappoint you. you you're not value. That gold has no value at all. That, those, that metal has no value. It's just this shiny metal. Uh, I would give it all away for a meal. Why is gold valuable? Simply because we value it. That's the only thing that makes it valuable. If we didn't value it, it would have no value whatsoever. Now that's an illustration of what I think all morality is, or all value is like, including aesthetic value, including ethical value. It all requires a valuing subject, a, a, a person, a mind that does the valuing. Notice I said it needs a valuing subject. That's where the moral subjectivism comes about. That's where it's subjective in that it requires a valuing subject. Now, suppose that there's no God. Suppose I'm right about that. And suppose that there's no God. Where does value come from? Humans. You know, I mean, that's the only value in the universe would be, well, I mean, assuming that we're the only creature, you know, the only valuing subjects in the universe. It would, all the value would be located in each of your minds or hearts or however you want to put it. Notice this, everyone would have their own personal set of values. So value is ultimate, would, if, if I'm right about this, ultimately personal. There is no value that's just, there's no morality that's just out there in the cosmos. When we talk about, say, natural law or whatever you want, how, that's a misnomer. There's nothing natural about value. It's not out there in nature. It's not, it, you can't find it in this. You can't find it in quarks. You can't find it in sacks of protoplasm or lumps of meat. It has to be mental. It has to have some sort of mind to do the valuing. So that makes value very, very subjective, very, very personal. But if there's no person that stands above independent of humans, then all you're left with is, what, 7 billion right now? 7 billion different standards of value. Now, of course, there's lots of overlap. You know, we like, we value a lot of the same things. But it's still just our preference. And there's nothing more than that. Now, of course, what are we going to say as Christians? Well, there is a human independent valuer. This valuer just happens to have created the universe, created us. So it has some sort of authority. But you need not submit to that authority. There are many cases where we do not value the same things 
that this divine valuer values, right? I mean, you guys know that. I mean, you've lit, you've, sin is a real thing. You might even rebel entirely, knowing perfectly well that it's just you, Satan. He has decided that his values, he is never going to align his values with God's values. So it's not a foregone conclusion that just because God is the creator of all things, that every valuing subject is going to also value what God values. He's not even necessarily going to force them to value what he values. Hey, if you want to value something else, you can. There's a whole legion of demons that have done that. So there's this... Well, think about it this way. This is, this is really... Um, th- th- this could get to the disconcerting, the disconcerting part. What makes an action right or wrong is solely this. That God judges it to be right or wrong. That is the wrong-making property for an action. The only thing, it's not suffering. Watch what I do here, and I'm going to put it into stark terms on purpose. God judges it to be wrong, and that's why it is wrong. God, it's dependent upon God's preferences or tastes. Now notice when I put it like that. Morality is dependent upon God's preferences or tastes. His values. I can hear Plato actually in his dialogue, Euthyphro. This is called the Euthyphro objection to this sort of, we might call this a divine command theory, which is what Christians have typically held over the centuries. Divine command theory, and that's what I've given you. But here's the problem. Well, wait, 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 wait a second. Is it, what is it that makes it wrong? Is it that God looks around and he goes, you know what? Uh, I've got an external standard of wrongness. Let me, before I give you guys a command, let me, I'll be right back. I'm going to check this external standard of rightness and wrongness and go according to that. All right, adultery, no. That's off the list, guys. That's wrong. You can't do that. It says so. Well, we don't want that. That's a bad... So is something right or wrong because... Simply be, so, so does God command something or command us to refrain from it because it's wrong by some other standard? Or is it simply this? Whatever God commands or forbids happens to be right or wrong. So it would look look this way. Get one of the angels to kind of write this down. All right. Gabriel, I want you to write this down. Um, This is is the ultimate standard in adultery. Wrong. That's going to be wrong. Put that down. Write that down. Telling the truth, put telling the truth on the in the other column. That seems a little difficult too. That can be bothersome. So on the one hand, you have God referring to an external standard, something, an authority higher than Him in a sense. On this side, you have Him just going, "Yeah, I'll just choose whatever's right or wrong based on my whims, based upon my taste or my preferences." You've got to choose one of those. Which one is it? Which one? 
both of them seem to be kind of cause us some uncomfortable, put us in an uncomfortable position. It's this one. It's wrong because God says it is. That's w- now, how do we get out of the problem, though, of it just being God being capricious or whimsical or it being just, uh, you know what? It's, it's totally up to whatever he says. He could have, if, he, if he would have said that rape is good, then it would have been good, given that we've chosen this side. We can avoid that if we chose this side, you know, and said, okay, no, he, re- he, he referred to an, uh, an external standard that's objective. But here it seems arbitrary that he, you know, if he chose rape, hey, I guess that would have been, thankfully, this God is the one that's in control and not some other God who preferred rape. Okay, there's two things we need to separate. There's a statement about value, and then there's a statement about God. The statement about value, it is true. If God would have said that rape is good, then it would have been good. That's just the nature of value. But now let me say something about God. According to our traditional theology, our perfect being theology that I'm going to defer to because it gives me the answer I like. So the perfect being theology says that God's nature, if he has such a thing, God is a necessary being and could not have chosen otherwise. He could never have, we talk about preferences or tastes, that seems kind of arbitrary, but it's not, when it comes to God, these are just, it's just his character. His nature is such that it would have, he is not the kind of being that would have preferred or chosen or judged or valued rape as good. So on the one hand, yes, value, value would mean that God would have to, you know, if, if he had chosen rape to be good, then that would have been good and we'd been, it'd be in a worse situation than we even are. But given God's nature and who he is, that wouldn't happen. So we avoid the arbitrariness by appealing to God's necessary nature, the fact that he couldn't have been otherwise. So that helps us. So we're grounded in a person. We have morality grounded in a person. It doesn't change. It could never have been different. And yet, it's still based on judgment, of valuing. Okay, so I'll end there. Notice what I've done is I've taken this I've removed the concept of objective morality from the table. There is no such thing as objective morality. So it makes no, it's not a thing. It's a, that is like a square circle. So f- when atheists try to justify an objective morality, they're trying to square the circle, well, not square, the, but they're trying to make a square circle. That makes things so much clearer. Rather than going, you know what, you can't really do that. That's, you know, and getting into the arguments. You just go, look, there's no such thing as objective morality. It's all subjective. So stop trying to ground it in the point of view, you know, this, as Thomas Nagel says, this view from nowhere, this point of view of the universe. There's no point of view of the impersonal universe. There's nothing like that. There's human persons and divine persons. Value is grounded in those. Take your pick. But don't try to choose, don't try to choose a third option because there is no third option. 
notice what this does. This br makes it personal, brings everything back. This, this notion of the cosmos, it's just all about relation, relationships. I want it all, I want it all, it has to go back, it has to point to the person of Jesus Christ. This, it's got to be this, per, it's ultimately personal. As I said before, apologetics is about persons. It's constantly going back to this notion of relationships. Okay, so I'll end with that there. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, you. Um, maybe I'm trying to make a third option. I'm not sure. Uh, so, but I really appreciate it. This has been really helpful. Maybe you can just respond to this thought. Can it possibly be that morality is subjective and objective at the same time in the sense that God is the value and subject, but objective in the sense that we are ontologically made in the image of that God? And so... A subject derivative objectivity yeah so here's what you have to and maybe let me see if this answers your question so the question is is there something you know we've said I've said that the morality is subjective but perhaps there's some objectivity to it as well that we can still hold on to being made in the image of God there's this there is some objectivity to it when I say objective I'm using you know when I say morality is not objective I'm saying that it requires some valuing subject and that it's subjective in that sense. However, a lot of times what we'll use is we'll use objective to just mean human independent, independent of what any humans think. So there's an ambiguity when it comes to the term objective. One is just in uh, object, objective versus subjective, object versus subject. And the other is human dependent versus human independent. So there is going to be an objectivity to it in that it's entirely human independent. I don't know if that, okay. Anything else? Yeah, yeah Jenna. So based on that, you could say then, it seems that you'd want to add an element of truth this as well, because when I think of truth, right away I'm thinking something objective, something mind right. independent, something universal, right. and this is ultimately what morality is, what Christian morality is, or what God's morality is. So right. we're talking subject, we're talking object in a sense, but we're also talking truth. Is that Yes. Right? No, I think that's an entirely right. And we, we don't want to say, notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that truth is subjective. I'm saying that value is, but it's an objective truth, if I'm right, if it's an objective truth, that value is subjective. So truth is objective. It's either, it's either true or it's not, independent of what we think. In fact, there's a sense in which, and this is going to get me into a little bit of trouble, it's true or not independent of what God thinks. I mean, it's still, that's a tricky subject, but there is objective truth. We're talking just about value, not truth. So you're entirely right. There's going to be objective truth, and we don't want to give that up. Well, actually, we can't give that up. It would be impossible. Yeah, I appreciate Jonah's remark because I was listening to you and I was thinking, why not say that nothing is objective because nothing is above God? Everything, you know, it's, it's, it comes from him. So, in a sense, I was thinking, would Dr. Stokes say that even truth is right. subjective right. because it's not above God, it's rooted in Him? Right. Um, and so, maybe, the, maybe it's really what we mean by objective. I, I'm not bothered by the idea that, that there is moral uh, objectivity, uh, there's objective right and wrong, in the sense that it's true or not true that such a thing is right or wrong. Right. Um, so anyway, and the other thing is, uh, I was thinking, does that give the idea that something is wrong because it hurts God? So
so he's hurt in his preferences and his tastes and he'd rather us not do such a thing because it's, hurt, it's hurting him and then maybe we're going back to the question of God's impassibility yeah. um, so anyway yeah and I, and, and, and I don't know the answer to that last, qu- that last question I, I do think that it's going to be I mean, I would, my gut is that it's grounded in just the way he is and not the effect that it has upon him that doesn't mean that there isn't an effect. I mean, again, that gets into the, the, the passability, impassibility. There could be an effect in addition to that, but it's not what causes the rightness or the wrongness. Yeah, we'll... yeah. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, you were uh, at the beginning of the lecture uh, subscribing to David Hume's test. You kind of come from an is to an ought. I was wondering, is that does that amount to digging a grave for natural law and burying it and putting a tombstone on it that says? Yeah, and well, I think, and th- this, that's an excellent question. So what does this mean, this can't, you can't derive an ought from an is, what does that mean for natural law? Well, I think this is a, tr- this is a tricky question. I think the word, the, even the phrase natural law is a misnomer. So there's a sense in which natural law, you want things in the, in the sense, you, you, you want some sorts of, sorts of laws as independent of humans. But I think it's wrong to say that they're in nature. So I would say that natural law is a misnomer and there's going to have to be a supernatural law is what they're trying to get at. So I wouldn't say that it puts the you know, tombstone on that, but I do think it needs to be rethought. And I think that natural law discussions can be a little dangerous because of this, because it puts this value, it makes it kind of impersonal, well, it makes it, it makes it impersonal. Now, that's not what they really mean, and it really, but I think our, when we think about it, we just have to remember that it is, the, the reason that I want to obey, and I, I love my father, you know, it's not because it's just, well, that's just the way it is, you know, that's just the way the nature is. So, uh, you know, homosexuality is wrong just because that's the way nature happens to be. No, it's because my father says that it's wrong. And I'm loyal to him. I love him. This is my father's house. So basically, get this, morality is kind of like cosmic house rules. You know, each family has their different, you know, don't run on the couch. Other families are like, yeah, fine, go ahead. Couch, whatever. It's an old couch. God has his house rules that are grounded in him, and, but they're grounded in him. And things go better or worse for us as our values align with his. The closer our, va- the closer our values align with his, this causes so, so much dissonance when our values start to misalign. This is when we feel, this is terrible. This just, things are out of whack, out of joint. Yeah, Emmanuel. Uh, Evan, it, it um, has not uh, always uh, be said in that way. It's a reflection of how we, we thought about uh, the different dispensation, historical sense, not... Uh, uh, dispensationalism uh, and the covenant uh, uh, it's the, uh, w- uh, that there is a subjective theory of value and that uh, uh, God is the valuer we can see that in um, there is some uh, moral uh, law and uh, other law that has not moral uh, per se uh, sacrifice et- right, uh, right. etc and uh, we can live uh, with that because we, uh, we, we uh, it's at the order time, Father, take, do that and not that. And no, right. it's no problem. He says we can. Yeah, no, that's so, so what Emmanuel is saying, he's pointing out that there is a sense in which even in Scripture, there's a changing value of sorts. Now, how that's fleshed out in terms of God's character is, that's a different issue. Um, but we do see that things that were forbidden before are at times not forbidden later. So there's a, there, we do see some sorts of values 
changing? Is that kind of what? Yes. You, you and, and we see uh, uh, that we, we, we think that uh, there is God said so, so it, it is uh, wrong or, or not because we, there is a um, uh, historical redemptive uh, change. Right. Uh, but because it's uh, the law of the Father. Yes. No, I think that's great. And I think so it's really important to see. And this is one of the things that I, I so much appreciated about um, you know, when I start when I was taught initially that the Bible, there, there is a, a development. You know, say, let's say it's a covenantal theology, for example. You have this development over time. And it's not like what we normally think of, like a math textbook that falls from the sky and that's boom. The, that's the final word. It's a development. It's a redemptive historical development, which is, I just, that solves so many problems for me. Okay, so, well, thank you. All right. Very much. Thank you very much.